For those of you who are taking thesis seminar, I want to spend a few minutes about uh, what you can think about as you're developing your literature review. In this page called Literature Review Guide, I want to talk about some of the main points that I typically discuss and uh, things that I typically work with uh, learners when they're developing a literature review. There are a lot of points here, and I'll touch briefly on them in this video, but this page is really meant to be a source for you to continue to refer to as you're developing your literature review. Sometimes it's hard to take all of this into consideration uh, at once, but please come back to this guide as often as you need to. Watch this video as often as you need to to get your head around some of these points that I want to make today. A lot of the things I'll talk about today relate to things you should avoid, some things that you should consider. And I'm going to also briefly talk again about how to try to link the key points. It's very important that you think of your literature review in terms of key points, key ideas. And uh, again, if you can narrow it down to two to four key points, this is really going to help you narrow down the scope. This is one of the hardest things to do is to narrow down the scope of a thesis uh, literature uh, review is to try to, you know, sometimes we make the mistake of trying to include too much information into the theory. And so if you can think of your theory as having basically or being limited to two to four points, this is really going to help you, especially as you're thinking about these key points in terms of your own research and thing in terms of what you're going to be looking for, the data that you're going to be collecting, how you're going to analyze that information, and so on. All right, so if you look at this uh, literature review as we scroll down here, I've got a list of uh, things to uh, what to do and what to avoid. Now, this list is not uh, complete. I think these are, at the time of this recording, these are the main points that I think about. I could add more information. Uh, to these points. I could add some points to it, but for the most part, these are the main things that um, that we that I want you to think about as you're as you're finalizing your first draft. Today is February 13th, and our final draft for our our completed draft for our literature review is scheduled for March 5th. So we basically have three more weeks. We've already completed three weeks of the semester, so we basically have three more weeks to complete our final draft. So if we look at what to do and what to avoid, the first thing I have listed here is uh, try to write your literature review in the third person. So we don't want to talk about, uh, we don't want to use the pronouns, the personal pronouns, you and I or we. We want to limit the discussion to focusing on the third person. So the literature review and the results and discussion should be in the third person. All right. Um, there might be some ex exceptions in the results and discussion, but certainly for the literature review, and, and this is what this guide is meant to address, please stay in the third person. There may be some exceptions in the method section, right? And we'll talk about that later. So again, this is very specific to the literature review, the theoretical framework, only write in the third person. Now, this also relates to trying to avoid not to mention anything related to your study until the very last paragraph of your literature review called the transitional paragraph. This will be actually the first time that you mention or reference your own study. So again, the, the literature review, the theory is to address what others have done. So that's why we want to keep it in the third person. We're not going to talk, we're not going to use phrases like this study, right? Referring to your own study. <clears throat> we're not going to say, <clears throat> uh, we're not going to mention anything about the study itself that you're going to do later on. And so I would try to keep it in the third person. and. Avoid altogether referencing certain studies, saying this study, you can just mention the findings and uh, uh, we'll talk about parenthetical citations here in a minute, which is kind of related to writing in the third person. Okay, so the next point I'd like to address here in our list 
refers to certain words and phrases that I would ask that you try to avoid. Now, the reason for this, this is this usually causes students a lot of anxiety, especially if you're used to using some of these words or phrases. The reason why I'm I'm suggesting to try to avoid these words and phrases is that it really helps you to be a better, a more descriptive writer. It it talks about or really addresses your writing style and trying to choose the appropriate style for an academic text of this kind. So that's that's the reasoning behind it. The first is try to avoid absolutes. Try to avoid words like always, never, no one, everyone. Because usually uh, we're dealing with human beings and there are, are always exceptions. It really hardly ever is appropriate to say that all students or all teachers, regardless of what it is we're talking about, uh, there are always exceptions. And so that, that's the reasoning why we want to typically avoid absolutes. We want to typically avoid the word important, importantly, importance. Why? This word is easily overused. And I want you to think about everything that you write in your text. When, you're, when you use the word important, you're basically saying, well, this, what, this sentence that I'm uh, expressing, this idea, is important. Everything else is less important. Or, so we want to think of everything that we write as being important. And for that reason, it's not necessary to tell the reader, hey, this is more important than something else I said earlier. Everything is important. If it's not important, don't include it. There might be some exceptions in the case of maybe a direct quote, and we want to limit our direct quotes, which I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, there may be a few cases where... We might use the word importance, but I would say probably 90% of the time, it's even better to avoid it, paraphrase it, and instead of saying the word important, express the idea that, that shows the importance. This is the difference between showing and telling. We want to show the reader why our ideas are important through the way that we're organizing our ideas, through the way that we're providing evidence and support. That is going to express importance. Not telling the reader, hey, this is important. You don't have to think about it. This is important because I'm telling you it's important. No, it's kind of a lazy way of, of writing. We want to show, not tell. The next, phrases. Try to avoid phrases like, it is important, which is related to trying to avoid uh, the word important that I mentioned earlier. But it is important, it is necessary, it is vital, it is essential, it is good, it is bad, it is great, it is horrible. Try to avoid these phrases that begin with the pronoun it, right? And Because, again, this is expressing some sort of uh, subjectivity into our writing. We're basically telling again, we're not showing. So instead of telling the reader that it is necessary, that it is vital, that it is essential, we want to express, we want to show that the, the, the necessity, right? Why something is essential, we want to show, not tell. So we, these are some additional phrases to try to avoid. Now, the passive voice, we're, again, we're specifically talking about the literature review at this point. The active voice is preferred. This is something that is, very, that is stated in the APA manual. It's, uh, it brings your writing to life. There's a good reasoning for doing this because typically if we overuse the passive voice, our writing begins to feel stiff and dry and we want to provide a little bit more, um, I guess, more energy into our writing if you want to look at it like that. And so in many cases... We will, I may ask you to change a passive voice sentence into its active equivalent. So the active voice is preferred. And one of the most common types of passive voice that I find is the passive voice with a non-referential it. For example, it has been found. It was determined. These, In these cases, we want to avoid the... 
the passive voice with the non-referential it. If you say something like, it has been found that teachers make more than lawyers, all right? It's very simple to change that active voice. In fact, do away with that passive voice altogether and simply say, teachers make more than lawyers. We just get rid of it. And it makes our writing sound a lot better, all right? So keep that in mind, the passive voice. We will look at some possible exceptions and we'll treat the method section a little bit differently when it comes to passive voice. We'll talk about that later. Again, I'm, I'm speaking primarily to the development of a literature review, a theoretical framework uh, when, when I'm uh, creating this list uh, for you today. The next thing to think about, uh, the personal or subject pronoun. Try to not overuse the subject or the personal pronoun. I'm not saying that we, you can never use the personal pronoun, but I want us to be very careful in when and how we use it. Avoiding overusing personal pronouns. Instead, use synonyms. So here is some alternatives. If you find yourself overusing certain personal pronouns, here are some tips, some ways that you can try to avoid that overuse. You can try to use synonyms. So. Instead of using the personal pronoun, is there a synonym, right, that you could use that refers back to the antecedent? The reasoning why I'm, I'm and maybe I should tell you why it's, it's important not to overuse personal pronouns to begin with. The main reason is that anytime we use pronouns, there's a risk of some misinterpretation of what the antecedent to that pronoun is. Remember that a pronoun refers to some other noun. It refers to something else, right? So there's always a risk in doing that in not knowing what the antecedent is. And that's what we want to avoid. We never, we, we don't want, you, there should never be a time where the reader is asking, well, who are they, right? If you're using the personal pronoun, they, who are they? And they have to re go back and, and read the prior text to see, okay, well, who are they referring to? It. What is it when they use the personal pronoun it? Um, that's usually why we also want to avoid the personal pronoun we, right? But we also, you know, we're mentioning that we want to stay in the third person altogether, but we certainly don't want to use the pronoun we because we don't know who we are in that case. And so um, that's why we want to typically avoid overusing the pronoun, the personal pronoun. So synonyms, that's a good way to uh, change the, the personal pronoun to a synonym. We can use hyponyms and hypernyms. These, this deals with word families. So if you're talking about cars, maybe you can use the word uh, Ferrari if you're going to be more specific. This is usually typical when we're trying to move from the general to the specific within a body paragraph. It makes perfect sense to use hyponyms or think about hyponyms and hypernyms in finding word families that you can be more specific uh, to represent uh, whatever that pronoun would have been. And also you can use direct repetition, simply direct uh, just using the same term that was used earlier in the text and repeating yourself. Now, of course, we don't want to overuse any uh, anything and we don't want to overuse direct repetition. and this is something that I can help, you know, help uh, work with you on and, and trying to make that determination if you're not sure if you should use direct repetition or not. But synonyms, hyponyms, hypernyms, and direct repetition, these are uh, three different, four different ways that you can avoid overusing the personal pronoun. Now, the last thing I'll say about personal pronoun usage is in the topic sentence, that is the very first sentence of your body paragraph that represents the main idea of that paragraph, my general suggestion would be to avoid altogether personal pronouns. Okay, so never begin a topic sentence with it or they. We want to state what that noun is. We want to establish what the antecedent is. We want to uh, describe and mention very explicitly what that is. And then in subsequent sentences, if you feel like you're going to need to use a personal pronoun, think first, well, is there a synonym that I could use that would, uh, that would best 
you know, uh, express what it is I'm, I'm talking about. Hyponym, a hypernym, or even direct repetition. Or what are these, alt these alternative ways that I could write? Which one of these would be the most appropriate for the ideas that I'm writing, that I'm sharing? All right, so the next point, APA formatting. Now, there are many different uh, aspects of APA that we could talk about, but these are generally the, the main ones that I spend most of my time when I am uh, providing feedback to writers. These are the main ones. So the first is to use mainly level one and level two headings throughout your thesis paper. When there are only two main sections of the literature review, then you might then consider also a level three. In fact, you, you will need a level three heading. If you only have two main sections in your theory, you will need a subsection called a level three heading. Now, the seventh edition of the manual for APA changed in this regard. They changed what a level three heading is. And you can click on the link here to see the differences between the heading types. But make sure that you're using uh, the, for those of you who are uh, going to use a level three heading, make sure that you follow the seventh edition. It's on its own line. It's on a, the actual paragraph begins below the heading. It's left justified, main words are capitalized, it has a title case, and it's in bold. Okay, so that's a little bit different than how it used to be in the sixth edition. So make sure that you are checking the, that. Uh, and again, I think the, the link provides very good examples uh, between those two types of headings. The next point regarding APA formatting double space throughout your text, except in the references section and text within tables, making sure there is no additional space between paragraphs and between headings and paragraphs. So sometimes, uh, many times, this will require a change or some sort of change in settings in Microsoft Word if you're not using the template that I provided. All of you that are taking Thesis Seminar uh, are being encouraged to use the uh, the template that I included in Microsoft Teams. And I have set up that template to automatically remove some of the extra space that Microsoft Word automatically inserts between paragraphs. So you shouldn't have that problem, uh, but it's worth mentioning. And in some cases, if for whatever reason, maybe some of the change, the, uh, the configurations get changed or the settings get changed in Word, then uh, we'll uh, we'll have to look at uh, at that and uh, make those changes, but it shouldn't be a problem if you're using the template that was provided to you the first day of class. In the reference section regarding double space, in the references section, double space between each reference and single space within each reference. Double space between each reference and single space within each reference. Text within a table should be single spaced. The next point, indentations. All right, so two things to consider here. Number one, no indentation in the abstract paragraph. This is going to be the only paragraph that you will not have an indentation. Number two, a 0 0.5 inch indentation in every paragraph of the thesis paper. So the rest of your paragraphs should all have a half inch indentation for each paragraph. And if you're using the slider bars, if you're familiar with using the ruler in Microsoft Word, you can bring over that top slider bar in the ruler to automatically create an indentation as you're creating new paragraphs and writing your, and developing your theory. It's an automatic uh, setting that you don't have to worry about. You could also, if you need to, if you're doing making these changes or adding indentations at the end, you've already created your text, simply select the all of the text and go back in the ruler, moving that top slider bar over a half an inch. This might require that you change your units from centimeters to inches. I would recommend that you do that for the purposes of uh, this setting because otherwise you're going to have to deal with uh, like a 1.27 something centimeters and it's really difficult to find the exact uh, the exact indentation uh, for that purpose. So that's what I would recommend. Uh, the last point, I think I mentioned two 
points here. There's actually a third point when it comes to indentations. Reverse indentation in the references section is required. So the first line of your reference will have no indentation. That will go all the way to the left. And then all subsequent lines within that same indentation will require a half inch indentation. Again, the ruler with the sliders are going to be your best friend in this regard. All you need to do is select your references and move those sliders in the ruler. And it's a simple change. It's a one-time change that will be all that's required. Once you make those changes, then if you even add more references, and then that those settings should be fixed and should be set for you, and you shouldn't have to worry about it. All right, the next point after indentations, approved fonts. This is another change uh, with regard to the seventh edition when compared to the sixth edition. Now they have made explicit alternative fonts that are possible that you may use when writing a paper according to uh, APA. So I've listed those fonts here. I'm not going to go through, um, but uh, the sans serif font, uh, there are a list of one, two, three, four, five, six different types of fonts along with the size. So make sure that you're also respecting not only the font type, but the font size. I think by default, uh, Word uses uh, Calibri. And I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that's 11 point. Just make sure that that is the case. That's an acceptable font. If you want to leave it as default for your paper, that's fine. If you want to use Arial, make sure it's a size that's 11 point. Okay, and so on. You can choose and look at uh, these different fonts uh, and just make sure you choose one of those. Okay, so... APA formatting. Let's move on now to citations according to APA. These are very important. And as you're looking at, especially those of you who have already developed your uh, literature review and you're making changes and maybe using some of the citations that you used last semester, please take a look and take all of these three points that I'm going to share with you today into consideration. The first, use parenthetical citations. Those are preferred over narrative citations. I've included a link here that explains the difference between a parenthetical and a narrative. A parenthetical citation is one where all of the information of the citation is within your parentheses. So the author's last name or names and the year. If it's a direct quote, a page number will also be included in the citation, but all of it is within the same within the parentheses. The narrative citation are those examples where you might begin a sentence like, according to Ellis, and then in parentheses you put the year. So the author, you're basically referencing the author uh, that's not in uh, citations, that you're basically saying according to Ellis, and then in parentheses the year, the year would be the citation. We want to uh, avoid those types. We want to focus on the concepts. It's more important to focus on the concepts than it is the author. That's why it's best to try to focus more on the parenthetical citations where you're focusing on the concepts versus the narrative citations where you're focusing more on the authors. It's more important what the authors say than who said it. Of course, we want valid and reliable citations and references, right? That's a given, right? That's uh, the assumption. But we don't need to focus so much on the saying like who said what. It's more important the, the, the content, what the, the authors actually say. This will also make it a lot easier, believe it or not, in connecting and creating a flow of ideas from one sentence to the next. If we're, focus if we're focusing more on the concepts, then we can see how transitions move into the main points that we're trying to make. Sometimes when we change a citation from the narrative to the parenthetical, we observe that uh, in some cases we're not saying enough about the thing that the author said or the idea that the author said. So that's another reason it actually forces us to look more deeply about those citations to make sure that we're saying what we need to say, right, to provide evidence 
that relates back to the topic sentence. The next point related to APA citations. Try to paraphrase instead of direct quoting your sources. So if a direct quote is absolutely necessary, such as when someone expresses an idea in a particular, particularly unique way or, or states a word that is considered part of the, the lexicon, then we are justifiable, we're, we're justified in direct quoting the source. But we should never exceed 15% of the total word count as a direct quote. One five, fifteen percent. That's that's a very small amount. We should not have. We should not exceed fifteen percent of the total word count as a direct quote. So it's best to paraphrase. Almost always, it's best to paraphrase those citations. Put it that idea that comes from an outside source into your own words. You create your own way of phrasing that idea, and don't don't use. Any combination of two to more or more words that come from that source. Try not to mix up, try to paraphrase the incomplete idea all in your own words so that there's no, there's nothing that you're citing directly as, as far as the words that they're using. All right, so try to keep that uh, in mind. Also, try to avoid long direct quotes, those quotes that are over 40%. Okay, really, uh, I found that there is little reason to include long direct quotes for the purposes of our, this type of paper. If you, if you really feel that you absolutely need that, we can discuss, we can discuss uh, direct quotes of more than 40 words. The last point I'm, I want to make regarding citations according to the seventh edition of APA, and that is the use of et al. This is another key change in the seventh edition. Now, the term et al, right, is going to be used for all citations with three or more authors. If your source has three or more authors from the very first time that you mention and cite it in your theory, you will use et al. You'll, you'll include the first author listed and then et al and then the year. And I've provided an, an example here in the uh, in the page. So you can refer to that for an example. All right, so those are the key points that I wanted to bring up uh, with regard to what to do and what to avoid. Of course, I may add some others, but I think this will get us started. Uh, and, you know, the, the list that I've included here, these are probably, I spend 80 to 90% uh, of my time addressing these points, okay? When I'm looking at a literature review, looking at what changes need to be made, uh, most of my time is spent on these key points. Now, the last uh, few minutes here that I want to spend talking about uh, your literature review, this literature review guide here that I'm providing in Notion, relates to the key points. Now, I know this can be challenging, um, and maybe especially for those who have already developed some ideas, maybe you're thinking about another organizational pattern, you're trying to make it all fit. Let me stress again the importance of trying to include key points in your thesis statement and making sure that those key points are clearly articulated and, and mentioned throughout your literature. This is the best way to align, to create an, a coherent theory, a theoretical framework that relates to a thesis statement. A thesis statement, again, is the key idea for your whole theory. There should be no misunderstanding as to what the key point of your theory happens to be. That's why we're putting it at the end of the introduction paragraph, so that we're saying right away, this is what the key point is. This is why we're restating the thesis statement in the transitional paragraph, the last sentence of your theory, so that we remind the reader, hey, this is the main point of our literature review. This is my main thesis. Some people will ask you when you're doing your you're doing research, they they may they may ask you, well, what's your thesis? What's your thesis? That is, they're asking you, well, what's the main point of your of your theoretical framework? What's the 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 main point of your whole research? Right? We've we're only talking about our literature review now 
Uh, but of course, this thesis statement relates to the entire research process, including your own study, right? It's it's the main point that that is um, that supports why you're collecting and analyzing data, why you chose certain participants, and when you're expressing your results, it directly relates to a thesis statement. But in the theory, we're focusing obviously that on on that first in hopes that we are aligning our theory with the research that you ultimately will, will be doing, that you'll be starting here in about three weeks. All right, so I'm going to give you two ways that you can state your key points in your theory, in your literature review. Two, two ways. Okay, now I've uh, written out here, uh, try to explicitly link the two to four key points from your thesis, your thesis statement uh, throughout the rest of your literature review. Try to state that explicitly. There are two ways that you can go about doing this. Number one, you can state the two to four key points from the thesis statement to the level two headings that define the key sections of your theory. All right. Um, probably didn't word this uh, wonderfully, but again, you want to state the two to four key points in your thesis statement. You want to express that and and uh, show that in each of the main sections of your literature review. All right. So again, this is the easiest way I think to link those two. Now, there's another way that you can go about doing this. You can also mention the key points. Right, the two to four key points that you mention in your thesis statement, you can mention it throughout each of the sections of your literature review. Maybe the main sections don't mention the key points. They mention something else. But in your discussion, as you're talking about what and how and why and when and where and with whom, you're addressing those key terms in each of your sections, there is where you can mention those key points. And so I look at basically there are two ways that you can go about making sure that those key points are mentioned in your sections. If you're going to talk about two or three key points in your thesis statement and your main sections don't mention that, you're organizing it maybe through a you know theoretical or whatever organizational pattern you choose, it's important to mention each of those two to four in each of the sections. All right. For the most part, if you if you neglect and don't include those key points in all of those sections, there needs to be some sort of commonality. There needs to be some sort of mention of those key points in each of the sections, right? To make it relevant, you're basically comparing and contrasting these key points in different ways based on the sections of your literature review. So I, I hope this helps uh, looking at how, in your own case, how you can discuss these key points. Again, the reason why we're, I'm stressing the, um, you know, for you guys to determine and come up with these key points in your theory is to try to limit, to actually limit the scope of your theory. One of the easiest things to do when you're, when you're writing a thesis paper or a literature review, I should say, one of the easiest things to do is to talk is to include too much information, to talk about too many concepts. And then what happens is when you start to collect your own data uh, and you're analyzing and presenting your own results, you're going to have to try to link your findings to what you mentioned in the theory. And if you are doing something in your own study that's not relevant to what you discussed in your theory, right, or you're ignoring parts of your theory, in your own research, then that's, we don't want to do that. That's a, that's going to be a problem. We only want to talk about, you know, what we can do in our own study. We only want to address in our theory, what we can look at and analyze and try to understand in our own research. Since we only have three to four weeks to collect data, we are limited in the kinds of studies and the topics that we choose some topics and uh, some topics are better than others when it comes to this limitation of three to four weeks in collecting and analyzing our data. 
And so this is why some of our discussions that we've had so far, um, suggesting a slight change in your research, only because we would need six months to a year or more of just collecting data in order to really address some of the, uh, really to address your thesis, to address maybe the research questions that you are considering. The last thing I'll mention, and I have not mentioned it here um, in, in this guide, is the importance of while you're developing your theory is also to consider the research questions. Okay, so probably I should have said that from the beginning, when you're writing your thesis statement, remember that is the one sentence answer to your research questions. That's really the, the one simple thesis, the idea that addresses your main research question. So think of your literature review, your theoretical framework that you're developing as the long answer, the detailed answer to the key questions, the research questions that you're going to later consider yourself when you're collecting the data and analyzing it yourself, uh, considering your, your own participants that you chose. So uh, I hope this helps, guys. Uh, different ways of linking the key points of your thesis statement. Some, some do's and don'ts, right, when you're developing your literature review. Uh, many of you have been sending me messages to take a look at your text. Please continue to reach out to me if you want me to look at something specific. You can leave comments in Microsoft Word, and I can reply to those questions directly. Be uh, happy to do that. I would much prefer that we work together and that you get feedback from me uh, throughout the writing process, right? Not just in our tutoring sessions, but also... Uh, between uh, our tutoring sessions so that you are making progress uh, with your literature review. At this point, starting we're starting week four here in a day or two. At this point, all of you should have your thesis statement in your Word document along with your research questions and your key points, your key sections, your level two headings. There are two to four main sections. You should have those in your document. Of course, I expect changes. Of course, I expect as you're developing each of your sections to go back and modify different headings, to modify even your thesis statement, maybe even modify your research questions as you're developing your theory. That's all good. That's fine. That's to be expected. But please try to start with those key sections. And I know this is challenging for some of you to come up with these key ideas. But trust me, if we can... If we can determine these now and develop these and modify these as you write the thesis statement, here's what we can avoid. We can avoid at the very end, after spending six weeks, we can avoid finishing a theory only to say and look at some research questions and then think, oh, well, this is not aligned with my theory. I have too many things. I have too many ideas and concepts in my, in my literature review that there's no, there's no possible way that I could include all of that in my own study. I want to have, I want to avoid that situation. And I feel if we work together throughout these next three weeks, as we've been working together the first three weeks, right? If we continue doing this, then we can avoid that very simple, but yet important problem, right? Of simply including too much information in in our theory. I don't want you to include anything that's not relevant to your study. I know this seems like a big project, but it really, we want to keep it manageable. This is why some topics are researchable and others are not. This is uh, what we are thinking about when we talk about what's the scope of our research. And if you get a question when you're presenting your own results and they ask you, well, what, why didn't you look at this or you didn't look at this? Sometimes the best answer is that's beyond the scope of my research. That's beyond the scope of my research. I didn't include that because I'm only focusing on this, this thing that I'm you know, talking about. And, and, and everything that I'm discussing is addressed in some way in my theory. Even if you don't, see something in your own theory, in your own research, you are observing and something in your theory is not evident, it's not, uh, you don't observe it, you can address it, you might ask questions about it from the t student's point of view or the teacher's point of view or whatever, you might discuss it and say, well, I didn't observe this, that's fine, that's okay, 
but you're you're addressing it. You're looking for those things. You're looking for those key concepts. Um, so try to keep that in mind. Uh, the last thing I'll say here is uh, I would recommend that you take a look at a video that I created today uh, from Melanie. She has uh, she's chosen a topic related to motivational strategies. And one of her questions relates to trying to make a decision about the main sections, what to include in the, as, as the key points in the thesis statement. And I think many of you might fall into the same situation. So I think it's very uh, important. And I think it will be relevant to many of you who are maybe struggling with what key points to include in the thesis statement, what to include or not include, or how do you state the key points. Um, so do take a look at that uh, video that I uploaded today and, uh, and, and try to take that feedback and see how that applies to your own personal uh, situation. Of course, if you do have questions, reach out to me, let me know. If you want me to take a look at something in your Word document, send me a message within the Word document, as I mentioned before. And um, if you have serious concerns, if you're feeling frustrated, you're just not sure what to do, what, what the next step is, that's when we need to have a discussion. I have no problem scheduling uh, discussions with you um, that address your concerns outside of our normal tutoring sessions. Don't spend one or two or three days or more lost and not knowing what the next step is. That's when we need to have either a conversation or you need to reach out and send me messages if we can clarify it through, you know, messages, through back and forth comments in Microsoft Word, great. But again, if you feel, if it's something that you really need further clarification on, make sure that you're asking for help. It's very easy in this type of class to feel lost because a lot of the content is online. And we're, we only have, unfortunately, we only have biweekly uh, tutoring sessions. And so for some of you, that may be enough. For others, you may need more. So you make that determination. You figure out what you need from me. Make sure you're getting what you need from me. And um, have patience in the process. I know sometimes it can be frustrating, especially after you've spent weeks developing a literature review in a prior class, uh, to come in and maybe look at that same theory in a different way. I know that that's a, it can be a challenging and it can be frustrating. So I, I want you to have patience with the process of and keep an open mind. And, and my intention always is to try to help you, in this case right now in this unit, to, to provide to produce the best theory that relates to your study, that it's very limited to exactly what it is that's going to be your focus and, um, and try to help you through that process of determining what your focus is. All right, guys. Um, I think we'll stop there again. Let me know if you have any questions. Today's uh, the 13th. It's on a Saturday. So, um, you know, make sure that you're, uh, that you're making progress, that you're finding your routine, and uh, make sure that you're making uh, some progress with regard to the, the literature review so that we're finishing by March 5th. Remember, that is our deadline. We've got three more weeks. So Friday, March 5th is going to be the day that your final draft will be, uh, that needs to be completed by that time. And at that point, I will download all the documents and uh, provide you feedback based on the rubric that I provided earlier. You can find it somewhere in these posts and in Notion. Continue looking through and becoming familiar with all the pages in Notion. Each week, I am adding pages as uh, based on our conversations. As I as things come up, uh, I'm trying to add additional pages uh, for that purpose. All right, guys, we'll stop there, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.